Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House taking a look at some of the guns they're going to be selling in their upcoming October of 2016 firearms auction. And today we're taking a look at an M1C Garand. This was the first adopted US semi-automatic sniper's rifle and it was kind of a dismal failure. Um, these are extremely rare and collectible guns. Unfortunately, they're highly faked guns as well, and we'll get into why in a moment. But let's begin by pointing out that when World War II started, the US had a semi-automatic standard infantry rifle, and yet the, most, the, the sniper rifles that were actually used in World War II were all bolt-action rifles. Well, a lot of people saw that as a problem. Why, why are we restricting snipers with this old bolt-action system when we've got the fancy new high-tech stuff for the regular infantry grunt? So there was a, uh, a project to develop a sniping version of the M1 at Springfield Armory, uh, as well as being open to other entrants. And ultimately, after some experimentation, including prismatic scopes and some, some interesting ideas, ultimately the, the decision came down to two different variants, the M1E7 and the M1E8. Now the E8 was a version that was designed by John Garand himself and, and team members. And that would actually go on to be adopted as the M1D. And we'll take a look at that in a later video. The M1E7 was a system designed by the Griffin and Howe Company, a well-known uh, sporting rifle manufacturer uh, out of New York. And theirs was adopted as the M1C. Now, there was a lot of, the Springfield Armory was not happy about that decision. They thought there were a lot of problems with the M1C design. And they had some good points. Now, the way this system works is basically just a scope rail screwed onto the left side of an M1 Garand receiver. The advantage here was it required uh, basically no other modification to the gun except a couple holes in the receiver. And you'd pin on a, uh, it was three holes for screws and two holes for tapered pins, and you'd put the pins in to hold the mount in place, tighten down the screws, stake them in place, and done. And then you have a detachable scope base, which we can take off like this. Uh, so you can carry this around in a protective you know, container can, uh, mount it on with presumably no loss of zero when you need to shoot, lock it down, presto, you're good to go. The problems with this, uh, really, the problems all came down to cost and accuracy. And it seems that actually political machinations had a lot to do with, probably, had a lot to do with the adoption of the M1C. So the problem uh, is, well, let's start with the first problem, which is these scope bases had to be installed before the receivers were heat treated, because once they're heat treated, they're very hard and they're much more difficult to drill accurately. So Springfield, which by the way is the only manufacturer of M1s that made sniper rifles, Springfield would send receivers to Griffin and Howe before they'd been heat treated. Griffin and Howe would mount this rail and send it back to Springfield, who would then heat treat the whole assembly. Now you might be wondering what, you know, how complex is this if they have to send, you know, Springfield Armory, the nation's premier military firearms facility, can't handle this scope mount installation themselves. Well, no, it wasn't hard at all. It was five holes drilled in the receiver and three of them tapped. It was a very simple process, which is kind of what points to politics being the rat, being some of the, the what was going on in the background. Uh, Griffin and Howe made a nice chunk of money. Uh, doing this work that was really actually quite simple work. Now maybe there was some patent or copyright stuff involved, but it seems more likely that some senator uh, managed to get involved in the appropriations process and decided it'd be really good for his district in New York if Griffin and Howe got this nice lucrative contract to do this. Now this annoyed the snot out of Springfield Armory because in addition to it being kind of insulting that they weren't being able to handle drilling a couple of holes, it was also a, a big, hurt, just a big obstacle in their production process. They had to take things out of the production line, send them to New York, 150 miles away, get them back, put them back into process. It was annoying. It, it was inefficient. No. So there was a second problem involved with this mount, rail mounting system, and that came up with accuracy testing. With the early guns, it was discovered that there were major accuracy problems with a lot of these early guns. And some testing revealed that the, the reason was that the steel composition was a little bit different between the receiver and the scope rail. I mean, that's not, shouldn't be surprising. They weren't intended to be made exactly the same. And the rail and the receiver have different requirements for strength and flexibility and durability and all that sort of thing. 
The problem was they were being permanently fixed together, screws, pins, and stakes, and then heat treated as one unit. And the heat treat would affect the two different compositions of steel slightly differently, and you'd end up with a little bit of warping between the two parts, which caused major accuracy issues. So after that was discovered, they realized what they had to do was send the receivers to Griffin and Howe, who would set the, screw, set the rails in place but not stake the screws. They'd come back to Springfield where the bases would then be removed, and at this point they started serializing the bases so they knew which rifle they went to. Uh, Springfield would remove the base, heat treat the bases and the receivers separately, and then reinstall them and stake the screws down at that point. You know, this is kind of a stupid process to have to go through. Um, but once they figured that out, okay, they were able to address that accuracy issue. Um, there was another accuracy issue that came up that turned out the, the tolerances on the scope base and the scope mount weren't really all that well done, and they led to looseness. There were, there were a lot of these scope mounts that just didn't hold a zero well, so they had to fix that. And they went back and adjusted the tolerances, adjusted the engineering drawings, fixed that problem as well. Um, they discovered that the flash hiders, if they weren't nice and tight, uh, those would actually cause the rifles to, to shoot worse. Now, if they were tight, if they were done well and properly, they could actually enhance the accuracy of the rifle. Uh, but if they were loose, they'd mess up the barrel harmonics and you'd get a rifle that actually shot worse than without the flash hider on it. So they had to fix that. All of these things led to basically the M1C never being issued in World War II. Um, the guns were adopted in 1944, but it took them long enough to get all these production issues worked out that uh, the first few rifles were just barely being shipped out and issued in the Pacific when the war finally ended. Um, they were never used in the European theater because they just hadn't figured out how to get them quite right by the time the war ended in Europe. So, so that is the M1C. Now, I've, I've kind of made it sound like a pretty lousy rifle, uh, all that aside, once they got into the field, you know what, they're, they worked. They were durable scopes. They were effective rifles. Um, one of the other, <laughs> here I go again, one of the other problems with the M1C, because they were mounting these rails on bare, unassembled receivers, there was no way to tell how accurate the rifle was going to be when you picked it out to be a sniper rifle. Uh, put the rail on, and then the whole rest of the rifle got assembled, and then you got to test fire it and see if it was a nice, accurate gun or if it was a piece of junk. And a lot of them were pieces of junk, relatively speaking. They may have met standard M1 infantry rifle accuracy requirements, but not good enough for a sniper rifle. Um, an infantry rifle was about a four minute of angle gun. Uh, the M1C requirement was three minute of angle, which is still not something that most people today would consider an accurate rifle. Uh, so a lot of these guns had to go back and be reworked. Uh, there are a lot of little specialty things you can do to an M1 to make it shoot better, and a lot of that work had to be done to these things before they would really be effective sniper rifles. That said, they were in service for quite some time. While they didn't see use in World War II, they did see use in Korea. Uh, in total, about 8,000 of these were manufactured uh, by the end of 1945. Uh, and then actually about half of them were unmanufactured. The, the scope mounts were removed, the holes were plugged, and the rifles were reverted back to standard configuration, uh, I believe in the late 50s. Um, unfortunately, that led to a lot of those surplus scope rails becoming available on the commercial market where they were used to, in many cases, make fake M1C snipers. With all that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and take a closer look at the rifle. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the specifications of the scope and um, cheek pad and a couple of the other accessories. So of course, one of the obvious distinguishing features here is that the scope on this rifle is offset to the left. And of course, that had to be done because the M1 feeds from a solid eight round clip that has to go straight in the top of the rifle. There's really no effective way to single feed the M1. So if you're going to put a scope on it, you can't have the scope interfere with your loading. So the answer was to offset the scope to the left. Now, in order to facilitate that, they added a cheek pad to the rifle. Um, it's a leather cheek pad. What's kind of unusual about it is if you're used to add-on cheek rests on scoped rifles, normally you think of that as something that comes up over the top of the comb here to lift your eye up to scope level. Well, on the M1C, the level of the optic is basically the same as the level of the iron sights. This scope is, low, is able to be mounted very low because it's offset. However, 
obviously it's mounted off to the left. So the purpose of this cheek pad is not to raise your cheek, but to move your cheek to the left. And that's what it does. Now if we look at the mount, you can see the two levers here on the side. If I rotate those forward, I can then slide the scope off the front of this dovetailed rail. Uh, that works nice and smoothly. That, that actually worked pretty well. It's a nice stable mounting platform. As long as the underlying rail is in good shape and the fit between the two is good, you'll, you'll be able to hold zero when that scope comes on and off. You'll see there are two pins here and then three uh, Allen head screws. If we look on the inside of the receiver, you can see all those things coming through on the inside. Now, standard army practice was to peen those screws in place so they wouldn't back out. This particular rifle is a Marine Corps rework. That's why those screws are not peened. Um, this has a 1950s barrel. And if we look right here, you can see it's marked, well, it's a little hard to see, there you go, uh, SA-52. So that's why this one isn't uh, peened in place. I should point out there are no special markings, um, aside from this Marine Corps rework. On a standard M1C, you won't find anything special. It's not going to be marked M1C anywhere. It'll just say US Rifle Caliber 30 uh, Springfield Armory, which is the only of the M1 manufacturers that made sniper rifles. And the serial numbers will be between 3.2 and 3.8 million. That's really all you can say. There are some known blocks of rifles because the receivers were sent in small batches uh, each time but that's, that's more in-depth than we're going to get into in this video. Now, the scope that was used with this was a Lyman Alaskan, which was a commercial uh, rifle scope designed in 1937 and first introduced in Lyman's catalog in 1939. And it really was a very good scope for the day. Um, it was a two and a half power scope. Uh, these had a 35 foot field of view at 100 yards. They had a five inch eye relief, which is pretty nice. That's long enough to be comfortably shootable. You're not going to jam the scope into your eye shooting this. Um, we have windage and elevation adjustments here on the scope and, uh, and one minute of angle adjustments, I should, I should mention. Now there, are, there, were, there were some commercial Lyman Alaskans that were used uh, early on, but the standard scopes uh, fall into two different categories, the M81 and the M82 were their designations. You can see this is an M82. The only difference between those two is the reticle. So the M82 is what the Army preferred, and that has a single vertical uh, post reticle. The M81 was the commercial version of the reticle, which was a, a simple crosshair. Uh, I should also point out the difference between the commercial and the military scopes was this sunshade added to the front and this rubber eye cup added to the back. So that's the reticle of the M82. It is a very, very simple, just a uh, single vertical post. Zoom back out of the scope here. You can see this is offset enough that you could still use the iron sights if you wanted to. Now let's take a look at these adjustments because this is this makes this works on a commercial hunting type rifle, but it was not ideal for a military sniper. So if you want to make any adjustments, the first thing you have to do is take off this threaded cap. Once that's out of the way, then we have a little dial here. You can see this is pretty small, and there are those numbers are uh, minutes of angle. So each each of these little white hash marks is two minutes and you have clicks in between. So this has one minute of angle adjustments on both elevation and windage. They're quiet, they're kind of subtle, you can feel them, but you cannot hear them there, I'm, I'm assuming. I can just barely hear them. In fact, I think I can feel them more than I can hear them. Uh, and it's not gonna come through the microphone. So this is, is not a super easy user-friendly system to adjust. Uh, also, the magnification is relatively low, two and a half power. However, what this scope did have going for it was durability. The Lyman scope was a, a durable piece, a rugged piece. It was well weatherized. That's something that we really take for granted today, that your scope's not going to fog up in uh, you know, inclement weather. But in the 1930s, that, that, wasn't, uh, that was more of a novel feature than it has become today. So these scopes were good at all of those things. From a basic military point of view, this is a scope that would work. 
it would always work, it would keep working, you could you know, use it as a backup weapon if you needed to. And that was more important to the military than having something that was the most, uh, had the most potential precision for a sniper. So we'll also take a look at this flash hider. Um, obviously this was seen as a, a more specialized requirement of a sniper um, to conceal the, the source of muzzle flash a bit. And this flash hider is a pretty simple thing. It's just a clamp-on accessory. It snaps onto the bayonet lug uh, and the muzzle, and it's just a plain hollow cone. Uh, if, if it's raining, by the way, and you have one of these on your M1, don't carry it muzzle up. As one of the early manuals points out, it will act like a funnel to direct rainwater down the bore of your rifle, which is a problem. Um, and to fit this, you just slide it on. It's held there, held there, and that little spring latch loops around behind the bayonet lug and holds it in place. So uh, you can see this hider comma flash comma M2. As I mentioned, Aberdeen did some studying on these flash hiders and discovered that if they were loose, kind of like this, which most of them were, they would contribute to some significant accuracy problems with the rifle. Now if they were a nice tight fit, you didn't have that issue, but this is part of the reason that uh, when the M1C was in production, the acceptance rate on first run rifles was only 40%. So more than half of the M1Cs that came right out of the factory were immediately rejected. Um, and apparently the rework success rate was even less, was only about 20%. Once, once a rifle got rejected, only about one in five of them could actually be restored up to uh, the level of accuracy that was required for service adoption. Well, thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. These really are very cool, interesting, and collectible rifles, even if they didn't really fill the sniper rifle role quite as well as everyone had hoped back when they were being manufactured. There are very few of these out there. It's especially difficult to find ones that are, are true, proper, provenanced, uh, authentic M1Cs. And, and that's a, why I took the opportunity to take a look at this one today, because it is. So, if you'd be interested in adding this to your own collection, definitely the highlight of any U.S. World War II collection uh, or M1 Garand collection. I'll take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to the James Julia catalog page on the rifle where you can look at their pictures and their description. And if you like the thing, you can uh, place a bid by phone or come up here and participate live in the auction. Thanks for watching.